will you stand with us and worship?
Amen. Well, we're glad that you are here to worship with us today. Um, we are excited about continuing our series about the Holy Spirit um, and just having him speak to us today as we dive into God's Word. Uh, this past Thursday was Veterans Day. Uh, I've actually had the privilege to serve at two different churches. I served in a Navy town up in Virginia, um, and then obviously here is an Air Force town, um, even though it has all the branches represented. Uh, but we just want to take a moment to thank those of you that are part of our church uh, that are veterans. And so if you're here today and you're a veteran of any branch, uh, would you just stand where you're at? So Mr. Mark, and Mr. John, Carla, we just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for your service. Thank you for answering the call. Uh, in recent days, uh, as I've dealt with and and talked with other of our church members that are still in the military. It's just that idea of uh, you wake up one day and they can just tell you to go. And uh, you are willing to do that. And so uh, we appreciate that. We appreciate your service um, and your time in that. There's uh, several announcements in the bulletin today. I just want to highlight a couple of those. Uh, Tuesday night, our men will be meeting up at Jersey Mike's up uh, on 96. Um, and just having a dinner and some fellowship time together about 6.30. Uh, so if you're free Tuesday night, we'd love to have you come and join us for that. And then um, we were going to do a movie night this coming Friday, but Joe, who was heading that up, has had to go out of town. Uh, his grandmother passed away a, a day or so ago, and so he's going to be out in Texas with his family. So we've changed the date on that, uh, so make sure you make a note of that, and um, or else you can come Friday night and sit out in the field and stare at the sky. Uh, whichever, whichever works for you, but, uh, but we are going to do it a couple weeks, uh, a couple weeks later, um, and the date is noted in there. And hopefully, as you went to your bullet, uh, went to your seat, you got a bulletin. Uh, there's a connection card in there. We would love to have you take that with some general information about yourself and whoever might be with you here today. Uh, on the back of there, there's a place for prayer requests. If there's a way we could pray for you this week, uh, we would consider it an honor to do that. And so. Um, so I want to encourage you guys at the end of our service uh, to drop these into the offering basket as it comes by. And then the final thing is, as you can tell, I'm standing behind uh, our stack of Operation Christmas Child boxes. If I counted correctly, or we think we counted correctly, there's about 95 of them here. And um, so we're excited today to, to send those off. In fact, at the end of our service, uh, if some of you would help, Mike and Wendy Yearwood, they're going to uh, probably back their car up and and load all of these into the back of their vehicle. So if you've got a couple free hands uh, and can help them load that, that would be a huge, huge blessing. But, but before we send them out of here, I, I want to pray over them because the thing that this has to represent to us is not about what's on the inside of the box, but who the box is going to. So this is going to a person, probably a person less fortunate in a lot of ways than you and I are. Uh, it's cold outside today, but we woke up probably in a warm house. Um, unless, you know, you're going through that change and you still like it really, really cold uh, or whatever. But, but for the most part, you had the option anyway uh, to wake up in a warm house. Uh, you went and probably got a shower. At least we appreciate Hope you did. Uh, this morning, you put on clothes, clean clothes. Uh, you probably went into your closet, had a choice of shoes uh, to put on. You went outside, got in a vehicle, drove here. Uh, we had all of those opportunities this morning. These boxes are going to children who don't have those opportunities every day. They don't have opportunity to take a, a hot bath or a hot shower every day. They don't have uh, multiple shoes in their closet and they can just pick which one they want. They don't have uh, you know, multiple outfits per day, maybe not even multiple outfits per week. And... Quite honestly, we go out and buy toy after toy after toy after toy for our children, and they play with them for about three or four days, maybe a month if it's a really good toy, and then it just ends up in a pile. And these kids, this is pretty much what they are getting for Christmas. And so whatever is in here, whether it's a, a small outfit or whether it's a toy or whether it's crayons and a coloring book, this is what they're getting for Christmas. And so I always want to pray pray that God will bless these boxes as they leave out of here, and as they arrive, wherever they're going to arrive, all the way around the world, that as it goes into the hand of a kid, as they crack it open, they will feel the presence of the Lord there. 
And so let's just pray. Would you pray with me about that? Father, uh, today we come to send these boxes out to the world. And Father, we don't know where they're going to end up. We don't know the, the name of the child that's going to get it. We don't uh, know the picture or the face of, of the child that's going to get to open these boxes. But Father, we pray that your presence would be on every box as it goes out, not just these 95 as they go out of here, but Father, the thousands and hundreds of thousands uh, that go out from Operation Christmas Child every year. And Father, we pray that wherever these boxes land, whoever's hands they get placed into, that Father, as they crack the lid, that Father, they would, yes, see a toy and they would see some things they're going to get excited about, but Father, that the presence of the Lord would be there. And that Father, your spirit would speak to the hearts and lives of the people in those villages and in those towns. And that, Father, we would see that we may not know specifically and, and, and we may not know names and faces, but, Father, we would just see an incredible report from Samaritan's Purse of the gospel being shared, of those coming to know you as their Savior and beginning to walk that walk of faith with you. So, Father, we're excited to send these boxes out today and we pray that your hands will be about them every step of the way so they end up in the hands of those children. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Well, we're going to stand and say hey to one another this morning, uh, so let's do that real quick.
are true, you are true, even in my wandering, you are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing, you are life, you are life, in you death has lost its sting. Oh, 
are being transformed in his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This song talks about how the Spirit changes not only us, but it changes everything. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we only want to hear your voice. We're hanging on every word. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, we want to know you more and more. We're hanging on every word. When you speak, changes what we see and what we see when you come in the room when you do what only you can do changes us it changes what we see and what Oh 
spirit, Lord, we thank you for your presence. Lord, I've never seen anyone have an encounter with God and not be changed. So Lord, I just pray that you would breathe upon our hearts. Lord, that you would speak and that you would move in your word, Lord. I pray that you would anoint the words and that you would anoint our ears and our hearts to be able to see it hear it and receive it. Thank you that you give life, God. We love you. In Jesus' name. You may sit down. Thank you guys for leading us. Let me just say to you as a church, uh, we are blessed. And uh, if you don't believe that, uh, you just go to some other places on Sunday mornings and try to experience worship uh, like we get to on Sunday mornings. Not only are these people that come up on the stage talented, uh, they are very, very talented and um, years of training and practice, but it's their hearts. Um, a lot of people can sing, not a lot of people can lead worship. Uh, and the only difference between the two uh, is the heart. And uh, so we are blessed every week. And, and actually, I know Tucker would say today he's blessed to, to have all these who could serve while he's out of town this weekend. Him and Johnny are in the woods with guns. And I'm not sure that that's a good thing. But they, but they are in the woods with guns. And um, so I know that they, they're enjoying their time together with each other and so forth. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk really fast for five minutes. So you're going to have to listen really fast, okay? Uh, I'm trying to review what we've done the last couple of weeks because it sets the stage for where I want to get to today as we wrap up this series about the Holy Spirit, okay? The, the la last two weeks and this week are about the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. And so, so I want to give you a quick review. If you haven't been here, I'm going to try to catch you up. And, and then we're going to dive into some scriptures today. Uh, do not freak out if you look at the bulletin and see 10 points. It's okay, all right? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each point, so don't... Some of you have looked at that and already flinched and been like, oh, no. Today I came. Today I came. But it's going to be okay, I promise you. I promise you it will be okay. So let me... I'm going to have to do this sort of as a, as a timeline of, of what I've been talking to you about. Several months ago, uh, heard a survey, went on the internet, found the survey, researched it. That said this, 70% of adult Americans uh, profess to be Christians. That sounds like a good number. That sounds like a really good thing, 70%. Uh, However, the second part of the statistic uh, said this, only 60% uh, of those, so only 40%, believe in the Holy Spirit. 60% of the 70%, who profess to be Christ, who profess to be Christians, uh, sixty percent believe that the Holy Spirit is just a symbol, is just a representation, is just an adjective, uh, something to describe part of God is not part of the Trinity. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That is the Trinity, and we see that all throughout Scripture. In fact, when we did very the very first thing we did was went all the way back to Genesis chapter one. And we see in verse 2, I mean, we're only two verses in, that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, hovered above all that was there before God began to create it and form it and mold it and speak into life uh, in what we know now as earth and the universe, right? The Spirit was there. 
And, and a couple of verses down in 26 and 27, uh, it says the Holy Spirit, uh, when God said, let us make mankind in our image. He was part of, he was one of the ones that was there. Part of his image is put into us because each of us had that spirit inside of us. You know, we would call it spunk. We would call it passion. We would call it, you know, desire, the things that we like to do, the things that drive us, motivate us, move us. And, and that's part of having the spirit put into us uh, in mankind. And we looked all throughout the Old Testament, lots and lots of places. We could have read 20 more than we read, but we saw the, the Spirit of God help David. We saw the Spirit of God help Samson when he was bound up uh, with 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 wrap uh, with a twine or not twine but ropes and, and stuff, and it gave him incredible strength. We saw him help Gideon as he led the army into battle, and we see throughout the Old Testament that the Spirit of God showed up in different places for different reasons. Uh, like I say, sometimes he gave people power, sometimes he gave people incredible wisdom, sometimes he gave armies incredible uh, ability to win the war, to win the fight. And so we see that all throughout the Old Testament. And then even when we get into the New Testament, we see Jesus is being baptized by John, and as Jesus comes up out of the water, it says the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove. It appeared as like a dove. And so we see the Spirit descend from heaven down to Jesus. And just at that moment, we, we read that um, God then said, and this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. So we have God in heaven, we have Jesus in the water being baptized, and the Holy Spirit descending on him. Three distinct people, three distinct uh, individuals, if you will. And, and so we see that in the New Testament. And, and we see in John chapter 14, Jesus said, uh, he said, I'm getting ready to depart. I'm getting ready to, to leave. And when I leave, I will send to you a helper, an advocate, a counselor. Uh, I, I'm going to go. And then in John 16, this verse has blown my mind, this whole series. John chapter 16, I think it's verse 7. Jesus said, Jesus said, it is best for you if I leave. Because when I leave, I can send the Helper, I can send the Holy Spirit back to you. What does that say about the Holy Spirit? I mean, what kind of, what kind, I mean, you know, I mean, if somebody were to say, look, it's best if I go so that, so that this person can come in. What is it when Jesus himself says, it's better for you if I go back to heaven, because when I go, I will send the Helper, the Holy Spirit, back to to you. And then we talked about, that was week one, boy, that was a lot. That was week one. Week two, we talked about the presence of the Holy Spirit because there's something that changes. In the book of Acts, uh, we see that obviously Jesus has ascended back to heaven. He even told the disciples, we're going to read it at, towards the end of the message, uh, that, that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So Jesus had told the disciples this. He had told them to go into Jerusalem and pray and wait for, the, for him to send the advocate, for him to send the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 2, we read the story of that happening. All the believers were gathered together. For 10 days, they had been sort of gathered together. They had been praying. They didn't know what to expect. They had never seen this Holy Spirit before. They had never felt this Holy Spirit before. They, they weren't sure... I mean, Jesus said it, and I'm sure they believed it because they were obeying, obeying what Jesus had told them, but they certainly didn't understand it all, right? And so in Acts chapter 2, it tells us that all the believers were gathered together in one place, and the Holy Spirit came. And when the Holy Spirit came, it came to all the believers, and, and that is where the switch is, okay? In the Old Testament, uh, the Holy Spirit showed up in instances. He showed up for a moment. He showed up in this situation. He showed up to help that person or this person. But in Acts chapter 2, the switch that takes place is now the Holy Spirit comes to all the believers. And what Jesus had told them is that when he comes, he will never leave you. And so all the believers are in that room. They don't know what to expect. They don't know what's about to take place. They're praying, and it says it begins to shake. The room begins to shake and it says the spirit comes in and the spirit comes to all the believers 
And from that moment on, he didn't come for a moment and then leave. From that moment on, he is in the lives of those believers for the rest of their life. And that's the switch that takes place. Because now you and I, if you're a believer, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have within you the Holy Spirit. Jesus has given you the Holy Spirit. You don't have a 90-day trial period. You don't have to know 15 verses and pass a test for the Holy Spirit to come to you. At the moment of salvation, the scriptures we read last week talked about it is the gift. He gives to us a gift in the Holy Spirit. So if you're here today and you're a believer, you need to know that you already have the Holy Spirit inside of you. It does not mean that the Holy Spirit is directing your life. It does not mean that you've surrendered your life to the Holy Spirit. It does not mean that the Spirit is accomplishing everything in your life that He wants to do. But if you're here today and you're a believer, you need to know that He is in there. That He is here in your life. And wants to be active. And wants to be. So so that 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 was just, wow, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Pretty fast. You guys listen pretty well. You know, it talks about that the Holy Spirit gives us spiritual gifts. He gives us specific talents and abilities. Right? I mean, he gives us talents and abilities not to be used for our glory or for our good. He gives us talents and abilities to be used for his glory and for his good and for the advancement of his kingdom. Right? We talked about last week, we wrapped it up by saying, how can I know if the Holy Spirit is working in my life? And we looked at the fruit of the Spirit. It's, it's sort of common sense. And just take the language. It's, it's what the Spirit bears in your life. As the Spirit is working in your life, it's those characteristics, those attributes, those things that, that sort of come out of your life. And, and I'll just spurt them off real quick. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. It's self-control, and I think I forgot one, but it's self-control. And so, so it's those things that, that the, the Spirit is producing in your life. And so today I want to wrap up the series by talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. Because I believe that the problem that we face today is, is that we do not see our country, we do not see our world operating in the power of of the Holy Spirit. And if I've got to get really pointed and really point the fingers, the Holy Spirit is not in the world. Your coworker that spent all weekend getting plastered and just doing what they wanted to do that, that has lived for themselves this week, the Holy Spirit is not in that. But us who are believers, the Holy Spirit is in our lives. And so if the power of the Holy Spirit is missing, I've got to believe it comes back to the believers, to the Christians. Write this down. If you, if you have a bulletin, there's, there's several write this down type things. You may be using version. This would be a great week to use version, uh, save you some writing. But some of you take really, really good notes. So uh, here, here's the first thing. Many would rather toil in their own power rather than humble themselves to the Holy Spirit's power. Many would rather toil through life in their own power. I'm going to make my own decisions. I'm going to do my own things. I'm going to do what I want to do, live how I want to live. Nobody's going to tell me any different. I'm going to do what I want to do. And there are people who would rather do that than to humble themselves to the Holy Spirit's power. Folks, that's just pride. Pride. I mean, you want to tell me that if, if 70% of our senators we're Christians and operating in the power of the Holy Spirit, you don't think our country would be a little different? I mean, if, if the House of Representatives had 70% Christians living and working and acting in the power of the Holy Spirit, you don't think they would be passing some different laws than they try to pass today? You don't think about media, you think about social media? If 70% of those platforms were, were Christians who were working and the power of the Holy Spirit, you don't think that Facebook would look a little different than it does today? How about the TV shows that we watch? I mean, I mean, I have direct TV, so I've got 200 stations. I'm telling you, there ain't 70%. There might not be 7% of all of those stations that, that are being operated by believers in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
You can't find 10% on Netflix of stuff that would represent Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. The problem is that, that our world is crazy. Our world is in a mess. And the reason is because we're not living and operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it begins with us. It does not begin with them. So many times we want to point the fingers outside the walls of the church. It does not begin in the world. It does not begin there. It begins in us. And if it will begin in us, it will spread out there. Romans chapter 1 sort of lays out the problem that we face today in our country. And, and it's, it's sort of odd that Romans chapter 1 does that because you know what? It's not a new problem. This is not a 2021 problem. This is not a COVID problem. This is not a pandemic problem. This problem has existed all the way from Genesis chapter 3. But here's how Romans chapter 1 puts it. Verse 21 starts, it says, yes, they knew God. I mean, in the United States, we just have to admit, we know about God. And trust me, I've been in ministry long enough, there's always that one person that wants to say, what about the guy out in Africa living in the jungle that doesn't have internet or a cell phone and maybe he's never known about God? What about that person? Well, we can maybe debate that or talk about that if you want to because the scripture does speak to that. But let's just be real honest today. Let's just talk about us. Let's not worry about the world. Let's just talk about us today. We know who God is. It is still on our money. It is still in our pledge. You can't get it on your license plate. Uh, I mean, you would have to live under a rock, in a cave, on the backside of a mountain somewhere to, to, have never have, to have never known about who God is. But here's what the second part of that verse says. But they wouldn't worship him as God. They knew about God, but they wouldn't worship him as God. That's part of the problem that we have today. There are people who know about God, but are unwilling to worship Him as God. They, they have the attitude of, well, I want to live my life the way I want to live my life. I want to do what I want to do. I want to make any, every decision I want to make, I want to make it you know, based on my desire, based on what I want to do. Hey, it's my money. I want to spend it how I want to spend it. I want to give my time the way I want to give my time. I want to take my weekend and use them how I want to use them. And, and who is going to tell me any different? So there are people, many, who, who know God but do not worship him as God. And it goes on to say, or even give him thanks. And they begin to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And, and we see that today. A lot of people have these ideas of what they think God is like. As a result, their minds became dark. And confused. How does our mind? How do our minds become dark and confused? It's always the same answer: by sin and Satan. That's how our minds become dark. That's how we become confused because because sin does that. Sin tries to twist up everything that God has tried to do and create and, and provide for us. Satan, whatever God creates, I heard this. I heard this this phrase from a pastor a while back. Whatever God creates. Satan counterfeits. Whatever God creates, Satan tries to twist. Whatever God does, Satan tries to, 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 to tear it down. And so it says, as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became utter fools. I mean, maybe, maybe no time in our life have we ever seen so many people who think they're so smart. Verse 23 says, and instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. I had, I had to stop there when, when I was reading it this week about making statues to people. We make all sorts of statues to people, do we not? Right? Again, forget about the world, just in our country. Right? Athletes. Right? You, you could go to a lot of stadiums and you'll see... Uh, some sort of statue outside of, of their f best player, the, maybe in their team history or whatever. Uh, we make all sorts of gods out of those. We make all sorts of idols out of those things. In fact, I even had this thought. There is a statue 
of Rocky in Philadelphia. Rocky is not even a real person. <laughs> he was a movie character. And yes, they've, yet they've erected a statue in his honor in Philadelphia. And we make, we've made idols out of those things, of athletes and celebrities. And it says birds and animals and reptiles. Verse 24 says, so God abandoned them, <coughs> excuse me, to do whatever shameful things their hearts desire. Does that not describe our culture today? As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself. I thought about that this week. God created the sun, and yet many of us like to worship the sun. God created the beach, and yet we like to worship the beach. God created lakes, and yet we like to worship lakes. God created the woods and the mountains, and yet we like to worship those things. God created our pets and our animals and, and those things, and yet we worship them instead of the creator himself. It finishes up who is worthy of eternal praise. So what do we do? How do we get out of this? How do we get to the place where the Holy Spirit sees free reign to work in our lives? What adjustments do we need to make? What There are some things that have to happen in our lives if we want to see the Holy Spirit work. I've, I've encouraged you these last two weeks to be praying and pray, you know, Holy Spirit, would you work in my life today? Holy Spirit, would you show me your work in my life today? And maybe you've done that. I hope you have. Uh, but if you haven't, how are we going to change our lives to see the Holy Spirit work in our lives? Write this down. Repentance is the starting place. That's not a popular theory in today's religious world. You don't hear the word repentance a lot in the vocabulary in a lot of churches today. But folks, can I tell you, you, you cannot go to step two until you hit step one. And step one is repentance. It might not be a popular thought in our society or even in, in, in our churches today. But folks, you cannot get away from what the scriptures say. Is that right? You cannot get away from what the scriptures say. Listen, John the Baptist came, right? John the Baptist was, a, was an evangelist. John the Baptist didn't care about what you thought about what he said. He was going to tell you the message of the word of God. And here's what he says in Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, real simple message, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. That's a pretty simple message. In fact, you, you might be going, Rick, you could take some lessons from John the Baptist. Two points and we're out of here. And hey, let me tell you, if, if we would do that, if we would repent of our sins and turn to God, we would see this church turned upside down. We would see our lives and our homes and our families revitalized for Christ. It goes on a few verses later in verse 7. It says, he saw the many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to watch him baptize, and he denounced them. These, these were the religious people of the day. He said, you brood of snakes, he exclaimed, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Get verse 8. Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe because we're descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. And then John goes on to say this in verse 11. He says, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone who is coming soon, who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not worthy to even be his slave or carry his sandals. And get this, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And that's what we saw happen in Acts chapter 2. That, that the Holy Spirit came. It appeared as fire. Okay, so even that, that reference in verse 11 there is not 
uh, you know, it didn't like, oh, he didn't mean anything by that. No, he, he was very specific. And that's what we saw take place. You see, repentance is more than saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is more than saying, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it's sort of like if any of you in here do you have two kids or more, okay? If you have one kid, they're an angel, they're perfect, they do nothing wrong. We, we, we understand, and I'm an only child, so I understand how that works. But if you have two or more kids, uh, you know, our two were pretty close in age, and so whatever one was doing, the other was, if they were in the front yard playing football, they were both in the front yard playing football. If they were playing basketball, if they were playing a video game, whatever one was doing, the other was doing. And there were so many times, whether it was in our front yard or in our playroom or on the basketball court, where, where Austin and Blake would just get into it. You know, they, they would just get in. A lot of times, Bobby would come across the street. We play two on two, so, you know, I guarded Bobby. He guarded me like the old guys, and, but they had to guard each other. And, and it happened all the time that the two of them would just go at it. And one of them would get mad and lose it, always, when it, when, however it happened. And so, what, you know, I have to come in. I'm the peacemaker. You know, hey, tell your brother you're sorry. You know, and, and I'm sorry, you know, that kind of thing. And you know how I know they weren't repentant about it? Because two plays later, they were back at it. As soon as they started the video game back up, the fighting started again. They weren't repentant of what they had done. They were probably not even sorry at that moment. They were just doing what I had told them to do. Repentance is more than saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is agreeing with God that our sin is sin. Repentance is agreeing with God. It's not telling God about our sin because God already knows about them. It, it, you're not going to surprise God by, you know, there's no shock value in our sin when it comes to God. But repentance is when we agree and when we say, yes, God, my sin is sin. Repentance has to do with a heart change that is displayed and followed up by our actions. I mean, it, you have to know this. You just have to know this. God is never going to tell you your sin's okay, don't worry about it. He loves you too much to minimize your sin. He loves you too much to say, don't worry about it, just slough it off, just that was the that was that was yesterday, don't worry about it. God wants us to repent of our sins and turn our lives so that our lives will prove, as it says, Will, our actions will prove that our hearts are being changed. Repentance is the key to initiate the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And again, I know that's not popular, and I know you may be even here today and go, that isn't what I came to hear today. But can I tell you the most loving thing I can tell you today is where step one is. And if you'll take step one, there's step two. And if you'll take step one and step two, there's step three. And can I tell you that God loves you enough and has loved you so much that he's waiting for you at step one. And it doesn't matter what happened before step one. You say, oh, I've sinned a whole lot. My, my list of sins is many. He, that doesn't scare him. He isn't worried about that. He's just waiting for you at step one to come to repentance. So what do we do? How do we see the Holy Spirit work in our lives uh, after we come to repentance? You may want to write this down. The Holy Spirit's focus is to change us daily into a better reflection of Christ. That's the overarching umbrella that every believer gets under. When we accept Christ and, and we're, we're saved and we come to know Christ, then the, the overarching process is that the Holy Spirit daily wants to focus us into becoming a better reflection of Christ to the world around us. Romans chapter 8 speaks to this. Romans chapter 8, and I'm going to try to read this as we work down here. The first thing we see in, in verse 1 through 4, it says, So now there's no condemnation for those who belong to, to Christ Jesus. There, there is freedom at repentance. Can we understand that today? That when we come to repentance, when we come to Christ and repent of our sins, there is freedom from condemnation that is there. 
And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you, or has freed, has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weaknesses of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do, and he sent his own, he sent his own son in a body like the bodies like like the bodies we sinners have, and in that body God uh, declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sin. He did this so just to, so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature but instead follow the spirit. We see that he frees us from the power of sin. Uh, there, there are several verses throughout the scriptures that tell us that the law was given in the Old Testament not to be followed because there was no way you could follow the law. And just so you know, we think of the law as the Ten Commandments. Uh, there were over 330 laws to be followed, to live your life day after day, week after week, by these 330 laws. There were some laws that could dictate what you could eat, when you could eat, and those kinds of things. And let me just tell you, in Georgia, nobody could have followed the law because you couldn't eat pork by the law. But the law was given just to prove to us Try as hard as you want to, bud. You can't do it. You cannot follow the law. And so, so God, got off, God sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins, to then send us the Holy Spirit to give us freedom over the power of sin. Verse 5 picks up. It says, it says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about the things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. And can I just stop right there and say, if I, if I ask you to boil your whole life down to what you really, really want in life, it's probably life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. The second thing that it tells us the Spirit does here is He allows us to please God. See, I, I think most of us want to live a life of peace. I think most of us would rather, I, I mean, if you've ever lived a life of chaos and then you find a life of peace, you, you see the differences blaring before you. And yet the Holy Spirit allows us to please God. Verse 9 reads, sorry, I have to get to where the light hits me. Like I'm almost like, so some of it has to do with my eyesight, some of it has to do with lighting. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And, and remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you, so even through your body will so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, and just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal body by this same Spirit living within you. There is coming a day where the Bible tells us if we have passed away and we are dead and gone, that the dead in Christ will rise. That is by the power of the Holy Spirit. So He will raise us from the dead. Just yesterday, uh, went to, to, to the, the, the funeral service, the memorial service for Lisa Duke's grandmother, 95 years old, been married to her husband 76 years. Yeah, you know, amen, and wow. And, and really, up until the last little bit, has been relatively healthy and, and you know, 
uh, able to do for themselves and, and those kinds of things. And yet yesterday we go to the funeral service and it's a great service and the, the, the preachers do some, you know, say some great words and uh, the, the guy sings, you know, the songs that we always like to hear at those times and, and they took the, the casket out and, and they took it to the cemetery, they put it in the ground. And folks, let me just tell you that, that, if, that if living with Christ you know, just carried us till that moment, it would be worth it. But the thing that gives us so much hope is when the scriptures tell us that one day the dead in Christ will rise. One day her body will bust out of that casket. One day the ground will break and the Spirit of God will bring her up. The fourth thing that we see here is verse 12. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you, that makes you fearless, fearful slaves, Instead, you receive God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. Now we call Him Abba, Father. For the Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are His children, we are His heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs to God's glory. For if you are to share His glory, we must also share in his suffering. The fourth thing we see here is that he adopts us in to the family of God. Verse 13, notice, notice that nowhere does it say that our sin disappears. It doesn't say that temptation stops. It doesn't say that the world changes. But what it says is that we, <coughs> excuse me, what it says is that we have been adopted into the family of God and we are no longer slaves to that sinful nature that drives us to those things. And it's clear that the power of the Spirit helps to put to death the deeds and the thoughts and the actions of our sinful nature. The fifth thing that we see through God's Word is that He is our helper. John 14, 26 it says, when the Father sends the advocate, you, you look up that word advocate, and there's a lot of definitions, counselor, um, conscience, uh, helper, those kinds of things. It says, sends the advocate as a representative, that is the Holy Spirit. It says, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you. See, he's going to teach us by his word. He's going to teach us by his example. He's going to teach us day in and day out when you wake up and your eyes open up for the believer class is in session you say well does he take the, you know does he do monday wednesday friday classes or what no from the moment your eyes wake up class is in session and his desire is to help you by teaching you by his word and by his example to remind you every day of his faithfulness and his love to remind you of what he's already brought you through and to show you and teach you where he's going to take you to. The Holy Spirit is our helper. The sixth thing that we see that the Holy Spirit does for us is he convicts of sin. John chapter 16 says, but if this is the verse I was referring to earlier, in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. This is what Jesus said. You know, the, the Spirit doesn't leave you on your own. The Spirit doesn't come to you and then go, go get him, boy. No, he, he's there with you. And part of the loving care that he gives to the believer it is the conviction of sin he doesn't convict you of sin to beat you over the head he doesn't convict you of sin to grind you into the ground he doesn't convict you of sin so that you'll sit there and feel awful and worthless that's what satan tries to do with your sin 
He convicts you of sin because he knows that there's a life that's better than the one you have right now. And he knows it begins when we repent of our sin. And he knows that the most loving thing he can do for you when we get off track, the most loving thing we can do for you when our minds get dark and confused, the, the most loving, caring, kind thing that the Holy Spirit can do for us is to say, whoa, 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 right here. We, we need to straighten this up right here. Dude, we got to get your mind right. We got to get you back on track. We got to get you back in God's word. We've got to we got to get you back because because we're chasing this rabbit of sin. Some people say it's not very loving to to talk to anybody about sin. Let's just tell everybody that God is love and God is love. His very character is love, and He loved you so much He gave His Son to die for our sin. Seventh thing that we see is that he gives us spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it says a spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. Again, God has given it. I don't have a lot of time today to break down all of these spiritual gifts. In fact, I'm going to do a video on our Facebook church Facebook page this week to try to break down those spiritual gifts so that maybe you'll have a better understanding of that. But suffice it to say, he gives each of us specific gifts, talents, and abilities, not to be used for our glory, not to be used for our platform, but to be used for his glory and to be used to advance his kingdom. I'll just give you one example. To some, he gives the gift of hospitality. You know, you know I've, here's how I've boiled down the gift of hospitality. If people can come to your house when it's not clean, that you have the gift of hospitality. Because I know a lot of us, if somebody was coming to the house, it's up at 8 o'clock, let's get to clean. And you don't just clean, you don't just vacuum. No, it's the baseboards and it's the walls and it's, it's the kitchen and it's the bathrooms. Even the bathrooms, they're not going to go in. I mean, you got to clean it all because somebody might see something. But see, to some, God's given the, the gift of hospitality to where they're like, yeah, come on in. Have a seat on the couch. How's life going, man? What's, what, what's, what's up? And, and God's given people that, for, for not so that you can throw Super Bowl parties, not so that you can just have, you know, big parties at your house. He, he's done that so that you can use that for, to advance his kingdom and for his glory. But he's given to each believer, every single believer, he has given a spiritual gift. Verse 8, uh, verse 8, number 8. He seals us to God. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 says, And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, who he promised long ago. The Spirit, get this, the Spirit is God's guarantee that he will, that he will give you the inheritance he promised, and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did that so that we would praise and glorify him. The Spirit is God's guarantee. The Spirit seals us to the inheritance that comes from God. The ninth thing that the Holy Spirit does for us, he helps us pray. Romans chapter 8. It says, and, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For example, we do not know what God wants us to pray for. Have you ever been there? I was thinking this week of some different situations I've been in and houses I've had to go to and messages I've had to deliver to family members and such. There are those times when you just don't, you're at a loss. No matter how hard you try, you really don't know what to say or even how to pray. But it says the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own 
will. So those moments when life is unbearably hard, when when times when those phone calls come that we aren't expecting, in times when, when there's a knock on the door and we just know on the other side of that door is something we don't want to hear. In the deepest, darkest, hardest times of your life when you can't even come up with the words to say, it is the Holy Spirit who takes our groaning and our crying and our weeping and he takes it to God on our behalf. He helps us pray. Number 10, the final thing that the Holy Spirit does is he gives us power. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, I referred to it earlier. It says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, it's Samaria, to the ends of the earth. He gives us power. He gives us power to live in this world that we live in. He gives us power to live in the crazy days we've had to live in. He gives us power to live. But get get this, his reason is so much different than we would want to say. He gives you this power so that you will be his witnesses to others. So that others will see your life and maybe they're examining you from afar. Maybe they have the the, the, the desk next to you maybe it's a family member who who only sees you at the holidays but but man when they're going to see you this year there's going to be something different what's different about you it's the power that the holy spirit has given to me it is the power of the holy spirit in my life as a believer as i close out this series today i want to wrap it up by saying this And I've told several people this just in the last couple of weeks. That I believe with all of my heart that God is about to do something in the life of our church. And the word that I've used to try to describe it uh, to some folks is is breakthrough. Breakthrough. We've all been, we all got punched in the gut. We all got sort of just you know, 2020 was just madness. None of us had ever lived through a pandemic like that. You know, as, as a pastor, I didn't, I wasn't sure how do we navigate this, all of that. And, and we all said, man, 2021 is going to be so much better. And I'm just going to tell you, 2021 has been worse in so many ways. But I believe that God is set for a breakthrough in the life of our church. I do believe with my heart. That next year, 2022, and even it, it can happen today before we ever get there. But I believe that God wants to do something amazing in the life of our people and in the life of our church. I believe God wants for us to have a breakthrough. And I think the breakthrough is this. As believers individually, that we come to grab the power that the Holy Spirit has afforded us. And that we don't just come to this building and sing praises and lift our hands and and read scriptures and pray together and and do all this kind of great stuff within these walls. But we come together and do all of that. But then we take the power of the Spirit with us outside of these walls to this world around us. And that's what I believe that God wants to do in the life of our church. He wants to do it with each of us individually. And if, we'll, if he does that, then corporately together in the life of our church, we'll see the Holy Spirit do and accomplish things we could have never dreamed or imagined. A breakthrough. So what's it going to take? If I could just be blunt. It's going to take the believers, the Christians, those of us who have received that forgiveness of our sins, to grab onto the power that is already inside of us. It's there. It's waiting on you to cut it loose. It's waiting on you to surrender your life to the power of the Spirit. It is there 
waiting for you to make the move. So my challenge today begins like this. If you're here today and you're not a believer in Christ, you've never experienced that forgiveness of sins, can I just tell you that God loves you, that he has sent his son to die on the cross for you. None of your sins will scare him. All of your sins have been paid for by the blood of Christ on the cross. And he waits for you today to come to him. If you're here today and you're a believer, you remember what I said, it starts with repentance. There may be some things in our lives as believers that we need to repent of if we're ever going to see the Holy Spirit break through in our lives change our family, propel our church to incredible things. Let's pray. Father God, today, as we read all these verses about the Holy Spirit and His work in our life and what He wants to do in our lives and how He wants to help us and guide us and, and propel us and give us power, Father. And yet, Lord, for, for many believers that, that are probably sitting in here today with the Holy Spirit already inside of them, they've yet to cut Him loose. They've yet to surrender our lives to Him. We've yet to, to repent of those things that we need to repent of. So, Father, today I pray, as one of those verses said, that the Holy Spirit will convict us. Lord, we used to sing that song softly and tenderly. Jesus is waiting. And today I believe Jesus is waiting. Not to hammer us over the head, not to grind us down because of our sin. He's just waiting for us to take that first step of repentance. Because he knows on the other side of that step is forgiveness. On the other side of that step is love. On the other side of that step is the power of the Holy Spirit. On the other side of that step is a life in Christ daily. So, Father, today he's just waiting for those who would repent, for those who would surrender their lives to him. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to stand and they're going to lead us in a song and two minutes, we'll take up our offering. Uh, they'll come down the aisle and get the baskets. But I just strongly encourage you today, don't leave here the way you